Welcome to China Daily Web Chat. I'm your host, Tai Muyuan. We're talking with Ms. Wu Changhua, the Greater China Director of the Climate Group. Today, Ms. Wu will share her perspectives on building low-carbon cities. Welcome, Ms. Wu. Thank you for having me. Our, our first question is, how do you define a low-carbon city? Well, actually, I don't really try to define low-carbon city. Low-carbon city at this moment, I don't think it's academically defined a concept yet. Rather, particularly for countries like China, it is a pathway for cities in the rapid urbanization process trying to figure out how to tackle the carbon issue in the building up of the cities and the industries around the cities at this moment. So for China, mostly, I don't see that as a low carbon has a, defi has a serious really definition there. Rather, it's a pathway for all the Chinese cities to consider at this moment in the rapid urbanization process. In there, though, and uh, the way why we call it low carbon, because the carbon issue uh, has been recognized as a very important factor around for climate change issues. And the cities around the world need to take actions right away to figure out how to address the issue. So we're hoping that the concept itself, actually, is hoping to put such a concept together, not necessarily defined very restrictively academically, make sure city managers, when they make decisions, they will take into consideration of the carbon element to make sure, for instance, when they build buildings, and they need to make sure energy uh, consumption and the carbon emissions need to be considered in the decision-making process. When you put urban planning together uh, for urban development, and uh, you need to take into consideration factors like energy, carbon, and environmental issues. So overall, at, the, at the, this point, rather than just a low carbon city, probably a lower carbon city is a more like an appropriate word to use at this moment. You came up with this low carbon solution regarding uh, financial institutions, enterprises, and government. And uh, low, lo low carbon urban development has been a major topic in discussion uh, between the three groups. Mm -hmm. So how has the proposal been implemented? And are there any successful cases that you'd like to share with us? Uh, first of all, I wouldn't really claim that I put together this concept. Rather, it has been recognized as a common practice of successes around the world. Uh, just imagine that we are talking about a low carbon growth. So fundamentally, this is a paradigm of de economic development. And in order for China to continue to grow in terms of economic term, in the meantime, actually, to grow in a green or low carbon manner, we need to figure out how to put a few pieces together, or very most critical pieces together. One part is a policy. The second part is technology. The third part is financing, capital. And the last part is market. You have to make sure the four pieces will really work well with each other in order to get where we want it to be. So if you look around the world, even look at it, you know, China nationwide, those are the elements that are really working, reinforcing with each other. If we address those four pieces really, really well, you started to see successes. Things really work well, you know, achieving the targets or the goals, objectives the government sets already. If those four pieces do not really work very well with each other, then pretty much we can sure we can make sure that it doesn't really work out. So around the world and. Uh, uh, the government need to do its own thing. So the players, actually, there were three. We all know this is a big triangle uh, relationship of the, any society. One is the government, uh, one is uh, the business community, and one is the overall society, which we would call like a public. And they all have their own roles to play here. So here, for governments, in order to address the puzzle, the government needs to put together the policy incentives or really effective policy incentives, make sure, as, as I mentioned, that's going to catalyze the technology innovation and the capital flow, make sure they're going to go towards energy efficient, low carbon direction. For the business community, they need to figure out to say, I, of course, I need to work really, really effectively with the government to tap into the potential and uh, the opportunity that put together by the government to capture the opportunities. More importantly, actually, the business community has a big role to play in terms of technology development and the services put together. And of course, in the meantime, actually, the business, as part of the business community, banks, financial institutions, they need to put the money together to go with the direction, with the flow. And of course, at the end of the day, the general society, the public, needs to have a stronger demand of the products and the services that are overall c categorized as kind of low carbon and green. So those are the kind of pieces we need to put them together to work out. That's also the biggest challenge so far for any decision makers in cities, in nations, or in provinces, and uh, how to put all the pieces together, make them work well.
So how can a city define its core competitiveness and grasp the market, uh, market need or market value accurately? Which cities in China have done a great job at this? Well, I mean, like cities, um, they're unique. You call them cities because they have their features. Cities are usually People come into cities for a few reasons. One, of course, for economic growth opportunities. Cities happens to be the one, actually, with a lot, seven, uh, three quarters of the world population already in cities today. When you have all those people together, you can imagine they need to consume uh, products and services. So that's where the market is. Pe so people already in cities that create a lot of opportunities. So you started to see more and more people moving to cities. Cities also is where people like to have a home. Right? And so they want to have a nice place to live and uh, very convenient with very convenient services in terms of education, culture, all kinds of activities. And of course, this is also where the biggest problems are. And the big, when you have three quarters of the population living in cities, you consume energies. And when you consume energy, you also em emit CO2, greenhouses, gases. So if you look around the world today, basically cities where we have about three quarters of the population kind of re living in cities, in the meantime, they consume over 80% of the energy, global energy, and also they emit about three quarters of uh, CO2 actually around the world as well. But interesting enough, what we want to do now is saying, okay, urbanization happens to be the trend. People will continue to go to cities because that's how the trend is going. And how do we really solve the issue? Make sure we're going to, yep, people will live better in a better quality of life, definitely having better quality of life. In the meantime, how do we eff effectively address the energy consumption and the carbon emission issues? I think that's where, why cities today, very importantly, we put together, either we call it low carbon growth at the city level, or we call it low carbon city, whatever the concept we're going to put together. So cities more than ever, actually, facing these urgent opportunities and also the biggest challenge to address those issues together. Look around the world, there are many, many cases and the cities already starting on this kind of pathway and particularly around the world. I think partly because the they went through this kind of different development stages where you know they grow and they pollute, they control, study to reduce their emissions and they get to another stage. So if you look at the Stockholm, if you, uh, if you look at uh, Melbourne, and if you look at a soul in the neighborhood, actually, they are pretty much on the track already towards this low carbon. So they already have the capability in terms of when they grow, which there isn't much happening. It's kind of incremental growth today, since they are over this high peak of growth stage already. And uh, they will be able to really say, OK, I'm not going to emit more uh, CO2s, rather, they kept their emissions already. They are pretty much at the 1990 level or 2000 or 2005 level with a cap already. So they are figuring out how to reduce the carbon emissions under that. But for a lot of cities, or for majority cities in China today and some other developing countries, we continue to grow. Grow not only, say, just growing physically, you know, geographically, but also with the population. We still have a lot of people moving to cities today. That's unavoidable. We're going to create problems in terms of consume more energy and in terms of emit more CO2s. And what do we do then? This is the biggest issue actually for China now. So Chinese cities today, I think this is a big subject area topic on the table for all the city managers today in China, trying to figure out, okay, how do I make sure, particularly around the new growth area, and uh, because the cities, wherever they are today, we call that that's a kind of build environment already. Particularly now, they are looking into the growth, the new growth part. Make sure when they grow the you know urban areas, when they put together the new urban planning together, they need to fully take into consideration the elements like energy consumption, environmental uh, protection, as well as carbon emissions. And in the meantime, actually, this is sort of unique to Chinese cities today. Rather than just urban areas, we all, all the Chinese cities carry this kind of burden called industrialization, something we call like this green industrialization process at this moment. And how do they make sure when they grow the industrial park, they are going to really also take into full consideration of those elements, make sure they're going to, the growth part wouldn't really consume as much energy as before. So that's kind of a bigger topic compared to, you know, if you compare Chinese, a Chinese city with a city, a well-developed city in the European countries, for instance, they, they face totally, totally different challenges. There are some commonalities, though, in that process. When you manage a city, it's sort of an urban area. So when you look at urban areas, so what are the key elements there? is urban planning, 
is at the urban, at the city level, how do you manage the energy? And then, of course, accordingly, you can manage the emissions. Meantime, you have you know, transport system, you have buildings, you have waste issues. So there are a lot of commonality issues that developing countries, cities, and developed cities, actually, they can literally learn from each other, particularly from developing cities, actually, trying to figure out what are you know, certain policy incentives, tools, whatever, you know, we could learn from that process and also gradually adopt some of them that are applicable to Chinese cities, make sure they're going to be applied here. And that's exactly what's happening now. So I cannot really give a lot of examples of Chinese cities today, say they're really they're low carbon already. I think we are still at this early, early stage. That's part of the reason why NDRC puts on the table, say, five promises, eight cities, so you champion, you lead. You lead the piloting of how this low carbon thing will happen, actually, at the local level in China. But there are cities around, for instance, if you look at Hangzhou, a beautiful city, and uh, since we work very closely with the Hangzhou government, and uh, we are very, very impressed with their determination, their knowledge, and uh, they are really on it. And so this is a, more like a journey, actually, for all cities in China, and trying to figure out, to say, okay, how to address this new growth part. In the meantime, gradually moving into how to address the build environment part, for instance, retrofitting buildings, how to make sure the cars on the street will be turned low carbon. And you started to see more and more Chinese cities going to electric vehicles. Of course, how far we can get there, that's still another issue. So overall, I think the dynamics is great in China now. But the challenge is, how do you put all the pieces together? So coming down to competitiveness of the issue, I don't think there's universal principles there. Say, you know, how a city will be really competitive, rather, uh, you know, the uniqueness of cities in terms of its living environment, in terms of the services you can put together, in terms of the industry, whatever economic structure you can put together. One issue, though, to emphasize before I finish this, uh, this uh, question is this industrialization part. I think that's where, actually, a uh, lot of cities or mo all the cities actually need to study really, really hard. In the beginning, we mentioned about the new energy plan. China already has more than 100 Chinese cities, basically, all put together on the table a new energy growth plan. So when you just imagine, um, when you have all the cities, more than 100 Chinese cities, putting a lot of emphasis on manufacturing wind turbines, solar PV panels, all things like that, are they going to survive? Are they going to be more competitive? No, because if you do not address the market piece, very often, very quickly, the bubble will be created. Then the, the bubble will very quickly burst. So what's going to end up actually for a city? Basically, you put a lot of investment together, but at the end of the day, you do not even get the economic return you want. So there's a lot of issues I think Chinese cities need to pay more attention to while learning from other uh, cities around the world, more importantly, trying to figure out how to pull all the pieces of the puzzle together, make it work here in China. So you were talking about low-carbon urban planning on city levels. Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of wondering, as a citizen, um, uh, what do what does it mean to like common people? Because uh, now we see all the real estate like developers they mm -hmm. try to sell the buildings. They have all the slogans of low carbon cities mm -hmm. or uh, environment friendly kind of living. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, now we have all these electric vehicles that mm, uh, the government tell the the citizens it is uh, it is uh, environment friendly and it is really good uh, for your uh, uh, for your path to um, low carbon city mm -hmm. building. So what does it mean to uh, common people? Like how you change their concept into um, living this low carbon lifestyle or this environment friendly lifestyle? Well, as an individual consumer, uh, you have choices when the market is out there, meaning when there are products and services on the market, then you can make the decision. You say, I have better awareness. I want to, you know, change my behavior, then I have the products and services on the market I can select. Today in China, I don't think we're there yet, but it's already started, uh, you know, and there are certain products and services started to get into the market. I think as an individual, there are a lot of things you can do, because at the end of the day, even though we emphasize the importance of a government and then the importance of business, at the end of the day, it's us as an individual, you know, consumer, it's our decision, our preference of the consumption pretty much decides where the, you know, the market is going. So that's very, very important. As an individual, for instance, you can start from your home. 
Starting from your home, meaning it doesn't necessarily today, as an individual consumer living in Beijing, you have all the choices to say, I want to have an energy efficient building you know, I can live in. We do not have that many yet. And uh, so actually today, in the real estate market, of course, the property is the most important factor influencing your decision and my decision as well. If it was cost too much, I couldn't really afford it. If it's not located in a convenient place or whatever, I wouldn't like to go there because I don't drive or other factors there. So you, you, but even now, even though, say, your building, like the building I live in, I know it's not energy efficient at all. And uh, because it's had big glass windows, stuff like that, and uh, so I know pretty much actually it doesn't really save much energy at all. There are technical ways of improve that, but I do not have the control over, say, the the place apartment I live in. Say, I'm going to change it, may may turn it into energy efficient, uh, you know, apartment at all. But certain things under your control, for instance, you can control how much energy you consume in your home. You can control how much water you can consume in your home. And you can control uh, in terms of what kind of products and services you can, you know, you can buy from the market that potentially with, you know, with a kind of low carbon or low energy consumption, that kind of features in it. And when you go to office, and uh, so you know, when you go somewhere, when you rely on the transport, you have the choices of take public transport, and uh, you can walk, you can do bicycle, cycling, whatever, right? And then you could, uh, you know, take a taxi, whatever stuff like that. You do not necessarily have to buy a car and uh, you could drive it all the time. So that's under your control. Uh, in office, there are a lot of things you could do. You could do basically make sure you turn off the computers when you do not really use it. When you go home, you turn off the lights as a habit rather than say you are not in the room and uh, the light was still on. And you can basically doing either to reduce the print out in terms of consumption of papers and uh, even double printing. Stuff like so, there are many, many ways of doing that. As an individual consumer, you can change. But ideally, besides all the things one individual, as a responsible individual to the to the earth, to the environment, you can do certain things. Ideally, when the government starts to really play their role and uh, make sure you know the policies, incentives are all together, and make sure all the business companies actually would produce the kind of products and services that are required, or you know, satisfying the this low carbon or green whatever the feature. And as individual consumer, you have more choices. For instance, if I want to buy a place, I have it, I could just say, oh, no, I do not. If this is not energy efficient building, I do I can decline. I'm not going to buy it today. Probably still. You know, kind of regarded as a luxury, but ideally, down the road in the future, hopefully in ten or twenty years, as an individual consumer, you have more power to make your decisions on the market.